Right, good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to the fourth in our closest series of webinars looking at current issues in treasury management and capital finance. This morning we'll be discussing the impact of the central bank policy response, specifically quantitative easing or QE from here on in, uh, on the outlook for inflation and market prices and yields. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nicholas Keeling. Uh, I'm part of the interest rate group at Arlen Close. So I'm responsible for formulating or assisting to formulate Arlen Close's interest rate uh, view. Uh, joining me today is Ian Williams, uh, Chief Executive of fund management company Charteris. Um, it's fair to say Ian wears many hats. Not only is he Chief Executive, He's also uh, the lead fund manager on three of Charteris's funds, uh, the Gold Fund, the Equity Income Fund, and the Strategic Bond Fund. So he's got a wide range of knowledge to talk about, really the wide effects of QE on markets. Um, before, we, before we start, I think it's fair to say that Arlen Close's views and Ian's views don't always marry up. Uh, I think we do have a slightly different uh, outlook for inflation and possibly for guilt yields going forward. Um, but as with economic forecasting, where we're trying to sell the future, and as with treasury management, in fact, where we're trying to hedge future risk, um, it's fair to say that we do need to appreciate the wide range of um, in order to hedge that risk appropriately. So um, hopefully the sound is OK. Um, good morning, Ian. Are you well this morning? Yeah, fine. You so? I'm I'm fine. Thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting how um, this whole coronavirus coronavirus pandemic throws up new situations. Uh, for instance, I, I never thought I'd be the one asking the questions rather than answering them, but but that's where we are today. Um, as we kind of lead, ease out of the lockdown, uh, just just as an interesting start, uh, when, when do you think you'll be um, getting back to the kind of pre-coronavirus commute into work? Um, well, for charters, well, we, we've opened we've opened our office all yesterday uh, on a sort of reduced hours basis. So from eleven o'clock to three o'clock, our office is now open. Okay, I think that's probably uh, quite common um, for yeah. everyone. Uh, to be honest, uh, Arlen Close has managed to maintain a, a skeleton staff about um, coronavirus in the office, which has been very useful for everyone involved. Um, okay, well, without further ado, uh, let's get on to the, the main subject, um, Ian. It might be useful for, for everyone who's um, listening today, just to give a background on, on what QE is, um, what it was designed to do and how it's been employed in the past. OK, well, it was uh, the architect really was uh, Ben Bernanke, who's former chairman of the Fed, who introduced it uh, following the 2007-2008 financial crisis um, of basically um, it was used effectively to bail out the U.S. banking system after the uh, after the crash in 2007-8, um, and it involves uh, the central bank, in, in his case the Federal Reserve, um, creating money or liquidity out of thin air, uh, and then using using that money to buy buy government bonds, treasury bonds, and okay. so injecting as a as a byproduct, injecting liquidity in, into the financial system. OK, that's interesting. I mean, um, it was widely employed uh, thereafter, both in the UK and, and the ECB. Did, did they have the same goal? Was it was it more focused on the banking sector, do you think, rather than um, the, the stated objective, which was to inflate um, the economy? Yeah, no, it was I think it was basically done to bail out the banking system. I mean, you, you re recall back uh, Bear Stearns uh, had gone bust. It was allowed to go bust. And uh, AIG, which is a huge sort of insurance company, was on the verge of going bust. And if AIG had gone down, uh, it probably would have taken Goldman Sachs and a few other leading counterparties with it. So there was quite urgent need to uh, to sort of rescue some of these big financial companies. And uh, they did it effectively through through quantitative easing. Um, that's what's different between what happened last time in QE1 and QE2. What's happening now? There's nothing wrong with it. The U.S. banking system is quite healthy at the moment. Um, so this is being done to bail out the economy, uh, and the bailouts are coming for the airline industry and the travel industry rather than the banking system. 
uh, and the scale of this QE is much, much bigger. So this is this is slight, although it's the same method, uh, it's quite a bit different from the previous QEs in terms of its scale and its target. Okay, and in terms of scale, what kind of numbers are we looking at between the two, um, right. two well, situations? Uh, the US Federal Reserve uh, in six and a half years following the crash increased its balance sheet by four trillion for nothing to four trillion dollars um, so and the Bank of England and the ECB did fairly similar proportional amounts uh, so they did four trillion over six, six and a half years this time round they've already done nearly four trillion in two months and according to Powell confirmed yesterday they're on course to do a similar amount. So within a nine month period at the end of the year, um, the Fed's balance sheet is probably gonna go from four trillion uh, before the coronavirus to approaching 10 trillion. So that's a, 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 a rise in the Fed's balance sheet of 150%, that's a rise in M0, the narrow measure of M0 supply, which was way beyond, way beyond anything they, they did last time and crammed into a much smaller time scale. Okay, that's, that's interesting actually, the um, the expansion over just a, a short period of time. I guess that to some extent sets the scene and brings us on to what effect has it had? I mean, that is, that is a significant um, injection into financial markets primarily. What, if, what effect has it had on financial markets, if any? The old adage, liquidity is a tide that raises all boats, and that's, that's what's happened. The bond markets have gone up, um, but the equity markets have gone up much more, and the gold price has gone up much more than that. So, and, uh, so the uh, you know all asset classes have gone up um, as a result of the liquidity. I mean, you've seen the FTSE go up from the 23rd of March when the FTSE was introduced. The FTSE's gone from below 5,000 to 6,200. Uh, the Nasdaq's gone to an all-time high. Uh, the German DAX is only three uh, percent, uh, retraced all but three percent of its falls. So this liquidity has just gone into all capital markets, and it's not necessarily over either. See, actually, on, on, on background to the uh, the call here, we've got um, two lines. One is the, the banking and balance sheet, and how that's changed over time. And you can see uh, the very um, what Q QE instances uh, that um, Ian's referred to uh, during the financial crisis and thereafter, which is really expanded balance sheet from from what, 50, 50 billion or so uh, up to well now it's over seven hundred billion pounds, uh, and and the scale of that increase is quite easy to see in the current situation. And that is quite a steep line we have uh, running over the last two months or so. Uh, and also, as Ian pointed out, the the rise in, in the equity markets, the FTSE 100 has, has fallen, as everyone knows, very significantly, but has also rebounded very significantly as well, although obviously no, nowhere uh, retaining the, the values it was pre-coronavirus. Um, that's interesting. I mean, the fact that um, it raises all boats, so liquidity raises all boats. Um, what does that mean for um, for gilt yields in particular going forward? Because I know gilts have been driven to, to very high levels. Um, you know, is is our current gilt yields uh, sustainable at current levels? Is that something we should be aware of? Um, well. The, the gilt market now, um, you've got negative nominal yields for the first four or five years of uh, maturity, and you go right out to the long, ultra long dated ones, and you're looking at yield sub uh, 50p. So, the problem with the, the gilt market is mathematically it runs into the uh, laws of diminishing returns. So you're getting to the point now where um, You've gone beyond the point of where there's any value in the market, and it's just sort of there at a yield level that is very difficult to sustain over any longer term view. And that's not to say these yields can't stay low for a bit longer, 
and we don't expect short rates to move for a year two years. I mean, we chatted about this before Powell confirmed it yesterday. Um, so we don't expect the short rates to move at all. Um, but the lot for, for an investor in the gilt market, um, you have a problem really. Why, why would you buy long gilts on 50p yields when equity yields much more? And the average equity yield is much more than the gilt. And not only that, the response to the liquidity, the equities are likely to rise two, three times more than any rise you're going to see in the gilt market. So it's very difficult to see why an investor who's not obligated to buy long gilts because of um, uh, asset uh, liquidity requirements for their pension fund, anybody who's free to make a choice between the different asset classes, very difficult to see why anyone would, would choose to invest in long dated gilts at the moment, because there's a lot of asymmetric risk in there. You know, because there's potentially things that as this, we evolve from the coronavirus, potentially all go wrong for the gilt market in a way they don't go wrong for the equity and commodity market. Okay. Yeah, that, that is that's interesting. That clearly, that is um, that is of great interest to our clients, many of whom are, are borrowers. And even though capital plans may not be as perhaps as extensive as they were uh, six months ago prior to the coronavirus, it, it's still a major. Um, most local authorities have uh, major borrowing requirements going forward, and actually, you know, the, the question of whether gilt yields will move from current levels. Uh, has a big uh, implication for budgets, although I have to be said, um, they are very low at the moment, and, and even with a rise from where they are, they will still remain low. Yes. Um, I guess I guess this brings us to uh, you know that that's the current that's the current market view, if you will. So uh, I think we I think we're in agreement that QE has, has simply pumped huge amounts of liquidity into markets. It's had a significant effect on, on asset prices. Um, it's had a significant uh, both both gilt prices and so driving yields down uh, and equity prices and gold, as you said. Um, I guess I guess the the main question here is is what's the outlook going forward? Uh, so we talked about the sustainability of, of, of gilts. Um, what's going to keep gilts afloat uh, at these kind of levels? You, you talked about sustainability already. What's going to drive the economic outlook, what's going to drive inflation, um, if anything, going forward? OK, well, this is what we think is going forward is that and Powell confirmed this yesterday. They're going to, they're going to carry on with their quantity in program um, and potentially do another two or three trillion of it. And the same thing is going to happen over here with the Bank of England. They're going to carry on doing it. And it's far more likely than not that they will do far more quantitative easing, and they will err on the side of doing too much rather than too little, because they're scared of not doing enough. Um, which means that uh, when you eventually get the economic recovery from the virus, um, you have an enormous amount of liquidity sloshing around the system, and they're not going to drain any of that out. They're not going to move to quantitative tightening. So that liquidity is going to remain, and it's going to have to go. It will find its way into asset classes. and we suspect that it will drive equity prices all around the world, not just in the UK or the US. Equity prices will go much, much higher than they are at the moment. And people will be sitting there and saying, oh, well, the PEs are, are gone up and the earnings are coming through. But it's not going to stop the equity markets going up because liquidity will go and it will go into the commodity markets as well. Uh, we expect gold in the second half of the year to go much, much higher than it is at the moment along with silver, and then eventually it spill over into base metals like copper and nickel and stuff. So there's, there's potentially big movements uh, afoot in uh, real asset prices, assets that you would, you would class as real assets. But the problem comes with monetary assets like gilts and cash and stuff like that, is they don't hold the same attractions going into what we perceive to be the next year or two. Um, and they're already at, at, at very extended levels. And again, looking at it from the borrower side, of the, the government wants to introduce a huge range of infrastructure products. Um, if you take one example, say a, a toll bridge or a toll tunnel, the, one of the biggest costs of a toll tunnel is your cost of capital. Well, if the government can borrow 50 year money at half a percent um, and they can build a tunnel under the Thames that's got a toll on it, 
and has an internal rate of return of 25%. That's a no-brainer. It just pays for itself. It, it's massively in the interest of the government to borrow as much money as they can at these very low yields while, they, while that window is still open and invest it in infrastructure products that have a payback um, way, way in excess of the half a percent that they've got to pay to borrow the money. So I would, uh, I would have thought it's in uh, anyone who's uh, looking at a bo- uh, government, uh, looking at the guilt market um, from the borrower side, it's in their interest to lock in as much of this borrowing as they can um, at these very low yields. And even to the point of uh, redeeming some of your shorter dated borrowing and rolling it forward and locking in these rates while they still exist. Because um, this is like a once in a 300 year opportunity to borrow money at these sorts of rates. And it's not gonna be around forever. Hi, Ian. Is it possible for you to let us know <clears throat> if this QE will create a future bubble or crash? Oh, yeah. I mean, this potentially is just building up an enormous uh, future bubble. I mean, what the, what the Fed and the other central banks are doing, they're bailing out one bubble by potentially creating an even bigger bubble. So, they're, But they're just pushing the problem further down the road. So they will be successful one way or another in bailing bailing the world out of out of this uh, this coronavirus uh, crisis. But it's not a free lunch. It's not a get out of jail free card. It comes at a cost. And the cost is what they're doing by directly monetizing their budget deficit is is um, is debasing the currency that's already in existence. That's the cost. Now you know, it's not it's not a free it's not a free lunch. It, it comes with a cost. And but this cost is probably a better uh, choice for them to let the whole uh, economy collapse. So, you know, if I was in the position, I'd probably do the same thing. But you you, you can't regard quantitatively what they're doing at the moment is, is not a get out of jail free card. It will come at a cost, but the cost will be much further down the road. And it will be a bigger asset bubble. Yes, you're right. Which is why we think gold and equities are much, much higher than this. Discussion there. Have we talked about the, the medium term outlook for inflation, Ian? No. Um, um, okay, well, that's, that's, that's why we think potentially this QE is different from the last QE 1, 2, and 3. Because everyone says, when they first started, when Ben Bernanke first started introducing QE, everyone, the consensus view in the market was that it was highly inflationary. It was Fed, Fed was printing dollars and it was inflationary. And Ben Bernanke, to his credit, said at the time, no, this, is, this won't cause inflation. It won't cause consumer price inflation. And people didn't believe it. And the price of gold went to an all-time high, $2,000 an ounce. Silver went from ten dollars to fifty dollars. You had a huge um, um, investor perception that this was inflationary, and there was a massive move into precious metals markets. And to be fair to Banky, uh, he his view really turned out to be correct because it, the QE never really fed through to consumer price inflation. Now we think that the reason for that is if you look at the old. Uh, Irving Fisher equation, MV equals PQ, MB in the money supply, VB in velocity of circulation. The combination of those two equals your inflation and your growth. Now, what's happened since, and it, it really started around the dot com boom, uh, was you've had a massive uh, deflationary wave uh, kicked in around 1999, 2000 two things really. One was the beginning of the retirement boom of all the baby the baby boomers that were all born after the war all started to retire. Uh, Plus it coincided with the globalization and the closing down of uh, thousands of factories in the West and outsourcing all the manufacturing to China. Um, So the effect of the US economy was it was a double deflationary wave and the UK and Europe as well of a combination of uh, a, a, a boom in retirement of, of all the babies that were born after the war, plus globalization. And if you compare the chart of US velocity of circulation, uh, it ties very much in with US labor participation. And they've both been falling for 20 years. And they've both been falling six, seven, eight years 
in before the crash of 2007. So when people say, oh, velocity of circulation collapsed because of the crash in 2007 and 8, that's not the full answer because velocity of circulation had been falling for eight years prior to the crash. Now, so what was happening, and the reason Ben Bernanke was correct, is that the increases in M, which were mainly M0, not, it didn't feed through to the wider measures of the money supply, were off, so a rises in M were offset by V. So the ultimate follow through to prices and output what wasn't anything significant. What's different, This what we think is different this time, is A, the scale of the quantitative easing is, 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 is miles bigger than it was before, but also these um, adjustments in um, uh, baby boom retirement and globalization, we think may have played out over the last 20 years to its fullest extent. And once the economy returns to normal, the velocity of circulation and the uh, labor rate participation will bottom out and potentially they don't even have to start going up they just have to stop going down and then what you have is an enormous increase in m not being offset by a fall in velocity of circulation but feeding straight through into price or output and we don't think it's going to feed much into output so that only leaves feeding through into the price levels so we think that this QE is inflationary in a way that the previous QEs were not. Okay, thanks for that, Ian. Um, this, is, this is to say that you don't expect inflation in the next 12 months or so, um, no. but the medium term outlook. So what are we looking in terms of timing in your view? At two, three years out or, or is yeah. this a long term? Yeah. Two, two, two years out, yeah. I mean, I think also the other thing it is going gonna, it's gonna to cause, uh, which is, 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 is the supply effects of the coronavirus, is um, you're at a very cyclical low in commodity prices. So a lot of this liquidity eventually is going to find its way into commodity prices. And that's going to be one of the big drivers of inflation going forward. And, you're, and gold is a lead, leader of all the other commodities. So you're already seeing gold at an all-time high relative to oil, all-time high relative to silver, all-time high relative to uh, copper, all sorts of things. So gold has led the way. Um, and what we expect to happen is all these other commodities eventually over the next year or two to eventually start uh, moving up uh, on uh, and copying what gold has done. Because copper is just as much of an inflation hedge as gold is or silver is. So if you have a rising and also agricultural prices, you've got a lot of uh, um, disruption to the supply of, and we expect to see wheat and, and food prices now uh, all enter major bull markets, which is going to be a mate and oil as well. Oil, you've seen the low in oil prices. You never see it for minus $40 a barrel again. They may come off, they may go down to 10 or $20, but, but you've seen the low in oil prices as well. And eventually they will go up as well. So if you look at, say, the um, uh, S&P relative to the uh, uh, CRB index, commodity index, that's sort of 50-year relative cheapness. So we think there's major moves coming down the track in commodity prices. So the big money-making opportunities for investors are going to be in general run-of-the-mill equities and in commodity markets. And eventually, um, I could... I could we could have put another chart up which shows the inverse relationship of bonds and commodities. If you get a big bull market in commodities, it invariably leads to a big bear market in fixed income bonds. So further down the track, big big rises ahead in uh, in equities, big rises ahead in commodities, and ultimately big problems ahead for the bond market. That would that would be our view, but not but not immediate, not for another year or so. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that, Ian. Uh, I, think, I think from Arlen Close's view, we, we're slightly more uh, relaxed about bond markets, especially over the next year or two, uh, given central bank policy. And, and I suppose that leads on to the next question. What's your view of the central bank response over the longer term? Are, are they going to keep pumping money in to try and keep yields low? Or do you think actually at some point they're going to have to step back and say, no, that the, the economy is fine now? Oh yeah, I mean, at some stage we'll have to talk about it. Before we get to that point, if that's point C and we're at point A, point B is that they will err on the side of doing too much quantitative easing rather than too little. You might as well be hungry if she was a lamb. They've done so much already, there's little point in pulling back. 
so they will do more than is necessary and be 100% sure that uh, they bailed the system out before they even think about stalling, never mind moving to some sort of quantitative tightening and, and, and reversing it. And Powell yesterday confirmed that in his testimony. He got no interest in raising rates for two years, no interest in, in doing any quantitative tightening, uh, and they're on course to do a lot more quantitative easing. Uh, and the other uh, point that was mentioned, as soon as Powell stops speaking, Mnuchin pops up saying they're going to help here, they're going to give help to small businesses more. This is election year in the States as well. Uh, Powell made the point that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't do it. He, there's only a limit to what he can do on monetary policy and you require fiscal policy. And no sooner as he sat down than, than Trump's puppet comes out saying they're just going to do everything it takes on the fiscal side to bail everyone out. Well, the, government, the US government hasn't got any money. The only money it's got is money it, it prints out of thin air. So, but it doesn't matter because the whole thing now, from Trump's point of view, is to get the US stock market, get everyone back to work, get the US stock market as high as he can uh, in time for election, election day. So that, there's no way any of these uh, different bodies are going to hold back here. This is, this is full on reflation. And I, I suppose I suppose that leads into a, another question, which which is the, the kind of title of, of this um, of this webinar. I, I think we're all agreed that asset price inflation is on the way. Uh, the question is, how much do you think it will feed into price inflation, and and what do you think in the medium term the central banks will do uh, to curb that if indeed it does come through? Because price inflation did not come through, as you said, from the original QE. No, it didn't. But then you're in a bear market in commodities as well. If you get a bull market in commodities, um, you will start to see some uh, pick up in uh, consumer price inflation. Uh, and the only thing is, is, you look at the UK again, um, everyone now looks at CPI. They've forgotten that what we used to have was something called RPI, retail price inflation, which inconveniently for the government was always much, much higher. Uh, and that sort of got abolished because the social security and welfare payments are now linked to CPI, well, which saves the government quite a bit of money. But there was always this criticism of, of moving to CPI was that RPI was just as reflective of what the underlying rate of inflation in the UK economy was and CPI. So you, there is an, and also uh, in the states where they fiddled around with the statistics over the years to produce lower numbers, is that both the CPI in the UK and the CPI in the US don't adequately reflect the, what everyone's day-to-day -day experience of what inflation is. Because although the CPI has been hanging around one and one and a half percent, most people's experience of their own internal rate of inflation is, is actually quite a bit higher than that. So. Um, you have to allow for the fact that the statistics have been doctored by the government to save the government money on welfare payments and, and, and pensions and stuff. So, um, but the key we think to consumer price, the CPI going up is in the commodity cycle. And we think ultimately uh, these, some of these commodities are going to have big, big price rises. And that's when it will feed through. Um, and what will the government do about it? Next question. Probably nothing. They'll just live with it. I mean, they don't. They fear deflation far, far more than they fear inflation. And they think while the CPI is at a low level, even if it jumps to two and a half or three percent, their target is to get it to two percent. If it goes to two and a half or three, or and they view it as a, well, it's only temporary because oil prices have spiked up or something. Um, they're probably not going to do anything about it. They'll just run with it, live with it for a bit longer, and it won't be for years down the road before if it really becomes a problem and you get very high rates of inflation that they're actually be forced to do something but by which time um the coronavirus will be will be long long uh, in in the rear view mirror it, 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 life will have moved on by then so yes i think you'll get inflation further on, but B, and B, i don't think they'll do too much about it anymore. That that was going to be my next question, actually, Ian. So thanks for that. Just just very quickly, there's one question that's come up in the chat, uh, but I'll ask you two other ones because they are related to what we've been talking about. One is, do you think Bank of England will take rate take policy rates negative? Uh, and the other is, do you think the government will engage in austerity following okay. the fiscal binge? 
I think the answer to both those questions is no. Um, first of all, with the, with the banks going negative, watch what's happened in um, uh, mainland Europe and uh, Japan. And all that's happened is that it, it negative interest rates have done quite a bit of damage to the banking system without benefiting the economy. And as Mervyn King pointed out in an interview, cutting rates from here by 50 basis points isn't going to do anything for the economy, but it will damage the banking system. So I think they'll look at what's happening in Europe and decide is it, that, that's not a smart move to do. And, and, and rates are as low as they're going to go. I don't think we'll go to negative interest rates. Um, and uh, sorry, the second question was? Uh, well, I think you've answered actually. The, uh, the, uh, government austerity, uh, I think oh, the answer, yeah, yeah. which okay. was, um, which was uh, fine. Um, I think one other I question. Think, um, I don't think Boris is an austerity man. I think even before this coronavirus blew up, they were planning a massive infrastructure binge. Um, as we talked about before, um, if you can, if you're the government and you can borrow 50-year money or even 100-year money at half a percent uh, fixed, that is just a no-brainer to build infrastructure products with because the cost of capital is your, your biggest cost element of this. So especially if they're toll roads and toll tunnels and whatever, those projects, airports, all have an internal rate of return of probably in excess of 15%. So if you can borrow on it half a percent, it's a no-brainer just to do as much as you can. Uh, and uh, it, it potentially benefits house building as well. So we don't think that uh, they'll go anywhere near austerity. Uh, Boris is not an austerity person. They want to, he's got to get elected in five years time. The government's lost a lot of credibility uh, over this hand in this virus. Um, and he needs to rebuild that back. He needs those northern seats if he's going to win again in five years time. And they're, gonna, they're just going to throw, and if they can borrow money and just build up the north and build up the infrastructure, they're going to do it. So I, I think they're going to go completely opposite of austerity. Uh, and just try and trigger a massive infrastructure boom, which is why on our equity side, we've been buying a lot of the uh, co uh, construction companies that we think will be big beneficiaries of that. So this is, you know, that, that's, that's where we think we're at uh, from our perspective. Okay, thanks that, Ian. Uh, I think while, while we might disagree somewhat on the median term outlook for inflation and gills, I think uh, I'm, I'm most definitely with you on both of those points, negative rates and austerity. I have one more question before we uh, before we wrap up. Um, uh, someone's asked, uh, what are your thoughts on value and growth stocks? Um, like guess of each. Okay. Well, if you're, if you're regard, if you look, if you're talking about growth stocks, if you're talking about Netflix and Amazon and uh, Microsoft, um, we actually think the US tech sector is uh, veering on ridiculous overvaluations. I mean, Netflix, which is not really a high tech company, it's just a home uh, video company, is trading on a PE ratio of uh, 90, 90 times earnings, which we think is ridiculous. Uh, none of these stocks give any decent dividend yields. So we think the US tech sector as a whole uh, is getting ridiculously overvalued. Um, and we think there's much better value elsewhere. Um, so whether you class uh, you know, some of the stocks we will look at are value or growth. We potentially think they're both. We think they offer good value and offer good growth purposes. But we, we don't, we think the US tech stocks are, are, are too overvalued. I think I read somewhere that Microsoft uh, is worth more than the entire FTSE 100 index in terms of market capitalization. So you're, you're getting back into the realms of 1980s when the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo was worth more than all the land in California. At, at the risk at the risk of prolonging uh, uh, the webinar, um, do, do you think then, I remember well the, the dot-com bust in, in the early 2000s, do you think we're at risk of a, a correction in tech stocks of, of similar proportions? Yeah, I think it's unhealthy. I think there's too much concentration in, in, in too few stocks. Um, I think that Google and Facebook, for example, rely on advertising. Um, there's no one of the first things that, that, that will suffer in this uh, when when all companies across the board um, suffer a downturn in the earnings, the first thing that gets a hit is the advertising budget. So I'm not sure that the earnings of, uh, and the growth of these companies 
can carry on at a rate that justifies the current price earnings ratios. And once these companies stop growing, they don't have to start shrinking. Once they stop growing, uh, the history of growth stocks in all sectors is that if they're on extended and very demanding PE ratios and the growth rate even starts to slow down, the stock prices of these shares can collapse. So we think there's quite a lot of risk in, in the tech sector at the moment, and it wouldn't be a sector that we, we'd want to buy at this level. Okay, thank you because very much. Like, you know, we think things like Rio Tinto Zinc, which is a 7 8% dividend yield, uh, ahead of a big uh, bull market in, in, in base metal prices, we think that's a value stock and a growth stock. We think it's both. And you get a big dividend yield uh, if you've got to wait a year for it to kick in. You get a big dividend yield, which is pretty safe to keep you, to keep you warm in the meantime. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. I'll have to stop you there. Um, I, th I think we could probably speak all day about this, but uh, we do need to let people get back to their normal day jobs. Um, thank you for your participation in this. It's been really interesting and very useful. I hope that all the listeners have found it useful as well. Um, for those of you who uh, subscribe uh, and listen to this regularly, you can become a regular subscriber to receive the emails automatically and the login details automatically. Uh, otherwise, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you once again for listening and uh, we'll see you next week.